Hi and welcome to this week's episode of the Property Doctor podcast with me, your host, Dr Andrew Threadgold. This week we're interviewing a good friend of mine, Miles Bullock. Now Miles is a lovely chap that's uh, done incredibly interesting things in property. He has a, a very large portfolio that he's built up with his business partners using all sorts of weird and wonderful methods. And he's done pretty much everything that you can do in property when it comes to the property investment triangle. So you you can tell there's a bit of rapport from the start with me and Miles because we know each other quite well. Um, And I'm sure that there's an awful lot of good learning points in here for you. So sit back, get a coffee, wait for an hour of great property kind of insights and education. And... um, I hope you get some value from it. All for now. See you next time. Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of the Property Doctor podcast with me, your host, Dr. Andrew Threadgold. This week, we've got a friend of mine, Miles Bullock, on the podcast. Miles is a very successful property person and happens to be my property mentor. So I know Miles quite well. I know what he's been up to, but we're going to declare all to the listening public and hopefully you'll get some sound bites of value from Miles because I've had lots over the past year or so. So first of all, how are you doing, Miles? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on. Your background is very blurred, which is of no consequence to those listening on the audio. But uh, you're hiding your office. I'm hiding my office. I'm, I'm currently uh, at the end of my garden. Uh I was previously working in my house and I've got two young kids, a, a three year old and a nine month old. And it just it got a bit noisy eventually to uh, to continue having calls next to them. So um ended up building something down the end of the garden. Yeah. Which uh, which is great. Um, except when it's raining, which is why I said we shouldn't we shouldn't do this when it's raining because it's phenomenally noisy when the uh, <laughs> rain no, it's it's good it's good to be down here. It's, it's nice to have uh, a space to um to work in away from away from home to, to yeah. kind of commute. Yeah, you can, easily commutable. You won't get charged with a ULES fee for getting down to the bottom of your garden, will you? So, no, I hope not. My friend's <laughs> just got, um, just, he lives in uh, Coolsdon and it's like 200 meters down the street, not even that far. Just down his street that he lives on is the ULES zone and he's just inside it. So, he, he has to pay every time he drives his car off the out of the drive. He's I've, fuming. I've... I'm definitely within it, but uh, fortunately, my car, whilst it is a diesel, um, it doesn't fall within that, so I don't, I don't have to bear. It. But I have just got my uh, my insurance, uh, having to reinsure. It's gone from about eight hundred quid a year to two and a half grand, um, and is I mean similar things with with house insurance. I've I've just got the house uh, quote through, and that's that's over doubled as well. And uh, with our portfolio, as and when we um, we have to 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 reinsure them, it's uh, going to be an interesting. Interesting yeah. uh, process to go through. Well, that's the beauty of infl- inflation for you, isn't it? <laughs> and all other things. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> so, for those people that don't know you as well as I do, let's uh, let's have a little trip down memory memory lane. What um, a little potted history of your background and how you ended up in in property, Miles? Well, I mean, I. I uh... I very originally started in property. I, I count the beginning of my, my property journey as when I started studying it. I did a a commercial property degree at university. Um, so that was back in 2006. And it was a, <clears throat> well, the, the course name was property management and investment, but it was, it was essentially a course on how to, um, how to do all things with commercial property and kind of look at things me, from a- Do you mind me asking why you chose that subject at uni? Very good question. <laughs> uh, we had a book at home that just had a list of all the possible courses, which which was a lot smaller than it is now, because I think you can do a course on pretty much anything these days, uh, which is great. Um, but there was, uh, it, well, it was originally my my dad's suggestion, actually, because he, whilst he, he was never in property, he he said that if he, if he wasn't a, a ship broker, um, he would have been in property. Right. And, um, so I... I did a bit of research, met a few people who who were surveyors, uh, spoke to them. And I mean, back then, I mean, I, I had no clue whether it would be the, the right decision or not. Um, but I, I went ahead with it. Um, and yeah, whilst I was at uni, I, I worked for a couple of property companies. I was a, 
a letting agent, a state agent. And uh, when I graduated, I I was I was working as a letting agent, but then I got a job for a company that was uh, based in Bath, but they were just opening a, an office in London. So um, yeah, wet behind the ears, I, I went back to London, which is where I'm from, um, and started working for this for this company, which was very interesting uh, from many respects. But it was uh, essentially what they they did. They they worked in the, the licensed and leisure sector, which is basically pubs, um, clubs, restaurants, uh, things like that. And the the biggest clients were Punch Taverns, Spirit, Scottish and Newcastle, all, all the big pub companies that have estates of five, 6,000 properties. And they had a, a few projects on that looked at the non-core assets of those of those companies. So think of a pub, it's not just the pub that's the, the property within that title. There could be a shop next to it that's within the title. There could be residential accommodation above, uh, way leave agreements for um, uh, electricity companies, poster sites, telecoms masks, all stuff like that. Stuff that's non-core to the company. And as a result, they, they didn't focus on those, didn't focus on on making money. They were just there. They were producing money, but they would they would focus on on operating the pubs and mm. and helping the the pub leaseholders. So, whilst there was a bit of involvement with with the pubs themselves, um, my my main role was was basically making more money out of all the non core assets. And I mean, some of them were just they were making what, like fifty quid a year, and it was my job to kind of look see could we make a bit more, um, uh, which. Yeah, as I said, really interesting. Um, great opportunity for that for that company. Um, I was because I was so fresh um, out of uni um, and just fresh to life in general. I I didn't have the best time. N- not to do with the company, more to do with my uh, my inability to to ask for help. Right. Um, <laughs> took my, too much on. Took too much on. Uh, thought I should know everything. Um, which I now realise in hindsight, of course, I shouldn't know everything because it's impossible to, to know everything with no experience in the industry. Yeah. But so I, I did that. I did that job for a few years, and um, it got to a point where I thought I I want to I want to do something completely different. So I started applying for jobs and and realised I want to do something different. It's yeah, it's quite difficult to get a paid job uh, being that young and not having that much experience. So I ended up taking an internship at a a media company yeah, right. and that turned into a job and i think uh about five five six years later i was still still working there um running one of the departments the publishing department um a, a tech website called it pro portal which uh, at its peak i think was about maybe one and a half million page views a month right okay but my job was to 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 look at the the revenue of that, basically the, the operations of it, as opposed to the, the writing side, um, and yeah, that, that that was eventually part of a bigger company that got acquired by a big PLC. I did a a few months there just to help with the handover of the the new PLC, and then started property again, mm-hmm. but on my own terms. Right. That was that was about eight years ago, just over eight years ago. Um, started Property NCs, which is our, our company, with uh, yeah, with three other people, and the rest is history. history. <laughs> yeah. So a few questions around all that. Then the um, when you started off in the first company with um, with your first job uh, involving in in estate agency and lettings and the the commercial aspect of it. Did you did you find the processes and systems that they had in place? Um, it, well, did you utilize those in your later career, or did you develop them yourself? Uh, good question. It's, um, I mean, we our, our main thing that we used in that company was was a spreadsheet. Uh, right. And I still use spreadsheets now. You Absolutely, love a good spreadsheet. Don't you? <laughs> They're my favorite. The first thing I think about when I wake up. Last thing I think about when I go to sleep. <laughs> I um, don't doubt that either. <laughs> <laughs> um, but 
I mean, because it's it was a, a well-established business, um, they they absolutely had certain systems and processes in place. Um, the uh, I know I, I I like the creative side of things as well, so I, I was kind of pushing for, for for them to update their website and make it easier to browse. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was it was a, a successful business uh, operating on fairly simple systems, but it didn't need anything complicated. Uh, yeah. spreadsheet of columns of what the address is what type of property is what is currently making who the occupier is etc cetera, etc cetera. and then just that sent around every uh oh no it was a, sorry it's a live spreadsheet uh <clears throat> shared on on a shared server i can't remember and uh, we would just go through it very regularly print it out on big a3 paper and, and just mark on the on the paper where we go through meetings updating everyone and um, yeah, very, very simple. Um, sometimes I, I kind of think back to those times and think we've, we've got a lot of different systems and processes in place now. Is it too complicated? Mm. <laughs> like, can it be done on a, on a much more simple uh, level? Which, yes, it absolutely can. Um, I think to a to a certain level. But if you want to if you want to keep scaling what you do, work with more people um, who won't necessarily be working in the same room, then you do need certain things in place that you wouldn't do if it's just yourself uh, mm. there, there was someone on the uh prosperity call the other week who uh one man band that, that flips loads and loads of houses mm. and he just has one spreadsheet and that's it um and they're all short-term projects as well so there's no kind of ongoing management which means there's not a need for that loads of systems and processes around that but yeah. I imagine if you want to scale that up and do much bigger, longer term projects, then then yes, you absolutely would need um, more systems and processes in place. Yeah, but, I think um, so. I, it was just it was interesting because as you as you have more projects on the go and then you're holding you know properties yourself, and each one has. I mean, in your case, you 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 guys like HMOs, don't you? So yep. you know when you've got lots of tenants and different units producing different amounts and different bills and services to each one. And, you know, it can very quickly become quite a complicated operation. Um, and I just wondered whether that link back to those early days helped you in any way, just structure your systems, give you a framework to work with. Um, because I, I think what the, the, the system that, that I probably shouldn't admit to, uh, because it's quite embarrassing um the system that i use the most that i remember the first thing that comes to mind uh, from back those days is is literally a to-do list i had really? to in in one of the first few days someone suggested i make a to-do list which i just <laughs> oh, it pains me to think that i didn't even yeah that i didn't do that but yeah we we use we use to-do lists i've, I've gone through lots of different types um a, a written re rewritten every single day to um so what we use now, which is called ClickUp, which is a, right. an online app, um, so it's on the phone as well. And when you've got, again, when you've got lots of different projects on that are longer term, where tasks will sit around for, for sometimes months, um, sometimes years, actually, it's good to have a really good and easy way of filtering tasks by property, for example. So we've, we've got it set up. We have a list for each property. Um, then we've got general things like... Um, investors uh systems operations virtual assistants executive assistants things like that uh and it just it, it's it serves as a good uh serves as a good way to to, to run some meetings uh, just by going through each of the properties like that um and the the, the one thing that i do miss about pe paper and pencil is when you rewrite your to-do list it it makes you reprioritize your tasks whereas mm. when it's on a big list in a computer program they just sit there and it, it, there's less of an incentive to to reprioritize and look through and there are things like you can put due dates of when it is and it, it orders it by that which is which is a good way of doing it but um yeah i think paper and pencil still does have a place in, in certain i think things. it does. Sense, certainly immediate to do this. sometimes I'll, I'll let just write the the top 10 most important things that day or to top five most important things that day just to really help me focus yeah i think it does i think it it, it still does have, have a place i'm not as tech savvy as you uh, you you're very good with spreadsheets i use them in my own limited way 
Um, but the whole IT thing, it's interesting that you you were involved in IT, even if it was just more of a looking at the revenue of it, because IT is something that is runs like a thread through what I know of your of you of you now and in the past. So you like you're heavily into Chat GPT and AI, and you use it all the time at the minute, don't you? It's, Which is something yeah, that I've like, not adopted yet. It, it makes such a big difference. If if you uh, certainly if you pay for it it's i think it's about 20 dollars a month you get extra functionality which does really help and it's starting to get even more uh complex it's, it's able to deal, deal with more complex tasks uh, i as as a just for a fun experiment i uh, uploaded a picture just a random scribble uh, and said complete this drawing <laughs> and it, it, the, the result was ridiculously bad it just yeah it, it couldn't it couldn't deal with that just yet but um we use it for things like simple less important contracts so for example we've we've made a loan between two of our own companies and just so there's paperwork in the background if we ever need it we'll we'll get chat gpt to, to write a contract so we'll give it the, the heads of terms specify there's english law and then it will write a very simple contract, which I, I would never do that for, for something important uh, mm. because you need, you absolutely need solicitors, lawyers, if not for their, their very in-depth knowledge, but also for their insurance. So mm. if anything does go wrong, you, you need to, to fall back on uh, solicitors and insurance. Um, but it's, yeah, but we oh, can also use it to, to write letters. So uh, we recently, we recently handed over a the management of a, a block of flats to a, a freehold management company so we wrote to the tenants <clears throat> telling them this is uh this is what's happening but that letter was the basis of the letter was created by chat gpt and then we just tweaked it a bit and then um then sent it out so chat gpt wrote to your tenants yeah, yeah mostly <laughs> <laughs> fabulous <laughs> I've also it's got a... super impressive though isn't it it is absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, absolutely amazing. It's, um, I mean, well, I've mentioned it to a few solicitors a few months ago, and they, I mean, they they hadn't heard of it. Uh, and I, I just thought you need to hear of it because it's going to be going to make your job so much easier because uh, yeah. they can. It starts a job, and then a human. At this point, a human kind of needs to finish the, the more complex ones. So, yeah. It's, it's... Yeah, I think I uh, I think I uploaded a well, copied and pasted a contract into it and said summarize this, and it just yeah. gives you like four sentences about it's it's absolutely phenomenal, well, converting the legalese into understandable bullet points. A lot of a lot of titles uh, titles that come with a property, they have very old English in there and they use complex terms just like a contract. Um, and there are sometimes terms in there that refer to very unheard of laws or, or um, yeah, anything like that. And I've I've used that before where I've copied and pasted it into um, ChatGPT and said, explain this to me like I'm a five-year-old. Mm. And very easy to understand. And it's, it's great because it, it not only is it does decipher what it's saying, it also refers to the, if it is a law it's referring to, it, it tells you what that means and in that specific context. So it takes away the time of having to search for that law, try and find the relevant part within that law, then kind of apply it to the document you're reading. It's, yeah. Yeah, deeply impressive stuff. Definitely an advocate. <laughs> yeah, clearly, yeah. Coming back to um, to when you started Proportunities, it's not just yourself in Proportunities, is it? So where did you meet your other business partners and how did how did Proportunities come about? Because you don't just suddenly go into a partnership like that with other people. No, um, so we uh, the very first person I knew was Ben Chai. He was an investor in the company I was working in, and he used to come in every so often and annoy the hell out of me. Um, <laughs> I he, he always tells people that when I when I first met him, I hated him, which which is a bit extreme. I didn't hate him, but I found him quite annoying because he used to. <laughs> He used to suggest all sorts of things which were it was not the way things were done, which which annoy me because you got to do it how the way things are done. Yeah, and uh, I I realised uh, fairly quickly that 
the reason he's done well is because he he thinks differently and does things differently. Yeah. Um, and so he asked if I if I wanted to invest in a in a project he got going on at that time. So I I did. Um, I actually went and see it, saw it uh, last week. Um, <clears throat> it's a it was a five well, a, a five bed and a six bed HMO in Swansea of all places. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, I had studied property at university. I'd worked in jobs, and I had I still thought that if you want to invest in property, you have to have loads of money. You have to have deep pockets. And what I didn't realize is that you could use you could you could work with the people with all the money and invest that way and it was it was a bit kind of mind-blowing for me at the, at the time thinking oh what you can buy a property with someone else's money and do work to it refinance it pay them back and then you got property essentially for free not including your time obviously uh, that yeah that was mind-blowing so um yeah we, we started talking more about property and um we so it was me ben and then two others that uh subsequently um, have gone off and done their own thing. Still good friends with them now. And then uh, Keely and Pete um, joined not not too long after we we started it. Uh, ben knew Keely through what was originally called Tigrant. There was an asset academy. All right. And... So it's a property training kind of academy type thing. Yes. Yeah. Right. And then she knew Pete from. Uh, well, since since she first came to, to the UK, um, yeah. So, mm. uh, the four so of that's us... interesting how networking, how you know, networking is essential, isn't it? People really underestimate the the power of networking and your connections. Absolutely, and it, it, I was the number of times I've been to networking events, and and I speak to people who they're they're doing property, but they're uh, they want to be doing it with someone else and um from the from my perspective of having worked with business partners for well, for, for eight years now i i'm always i always feel so fortunate that I've, I've had the opportunity to work with other people um especially because we are all very different so i tried working with a friend of mine years ago that was very similar in personality to me and, and not much got done right. um <laughs> Because... Well, you're too busy analyzing. <laughs> <laughs> too busy, busy analyzing, but also I, I think differing perspectives and opinions are really important when you're when you're running a business because you, you need to think of it from from different different points of view. And over the years, we've done as a uh, as business partners, we've we've done all the, the various personality profiling um, tools and questionnaires and things. I've actually had a list of them uh, somewhere here. So yeah, things like Myers Briggs, um, yeah. Fifth and Strengths Finder, Jahari's Window, which is yeah more an exercise as opposed to a, a, a test where you answer the questions. And then the, the most recent one we did was any the the Enneagram, which I mean I was reading it the other day and I'm I'm still blown away how accurate it is to my personality. Really? And yeah, it's it it gives me insight, and each time I read it, I learn something new and think ah. That's that's interesting. I, that is exactly how I am. Um, and so we 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 all do these, and then we we come together and look at each other's, and and usually we are four very different people. We we cover different different parts of the spectrum, which is why I think we've we've worked well together. Um, obviously, it comes with challenges as well because when you when you think about things differently, you have different opinions, and uh, yeah. Get in disagreements can happen but mm. um yeah i think that the more you know about yourself and about each other the, the easier it becomes to to work together and to yeah yeah i think that's vitally important having so up until this year i'd as you know i'd, I'd never done anything with anybody apart from with ourselves but this year opening myself up to to having other people involved in what we're doing is uh has really challenged me because I personally I, I'm I'm not an, an an analyzer per se I'm a, a, a an action taker and think about it later but having other people around that are more kind of analytical or more or question what you're doing a bit more and it's um it, it you should have different people 
from different parts of the spectrum to make a team, shouldn't you? You shouldn't. It's a lot. You're. It's a disadvantage in the long run if you're just on your own. I think. Uh, oh yeah, <clears throat> and it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have business partners that mm. fulfil those roles. It just means you you need to have people within or who who subcontract your business or who work in some capacity for your business to to fill those roles. Um, because I mean you you got analysis paralysis. Uh, that's a, a very common thing, and but you, the the kind of person who gets that tends to be the analytical person. Um, that, that gets stuck into the detail. But then you also need to balance that out. You need someone who sees top level, high level, and can um, kind of pull you out of that. And, and yeah, it's uh, an important synergy to have. Um, equally, the, the well, I guess it kind of comes under the analytical as well, but finances. The, I've, I've coached a, a fair few people and of all different types. And there are there are some who, who love a spreadsheet, some who don't. Mm-hmm. Um, both are perfect if you don't love it working uh, more closely with a with an accountant is is really important because if you don't get the finances right especially if you're doing lots of projects together then that's the first thing that can cause big issues and it's uh, it can be a bit of an exponential thing if, if debt piles up and then interest rates go up and um, yeah a bit of a, a horrible circle there so having Staying on top of that kind of stuff is 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 I think uh, one of the most important things with yeah with key business. skill that isn't it yeah to understand where your money is and you know your, your balance sheet basically understanding your balance sheet yeah <clears throat> we use well we we use a combination of spreadsheets obviously um, and we the spreadsheets we use is through Google Sheets. And the reason that is really important for us is because they are live spreadsheets and because all four of us we work remotely we don't work in the same office it's even more important to kind of to be looking at the most upstate version of something and when we have our our weekly team meetings we'll all open the same spreadsheet and we can make changes and everyone can see what's being done so that's that's one thing and then the other thing is zero we use accounting software zero uh, that is updated through a combination of our virtual assistants. So we have a qualified accountant working abroad uh, that that effectively reconciles all our transactions. And as you know, when you have a property, it's not just one payment that goes out every month. It's electricity, gas, water, council tax, uh, broadband, insurance. The, the, yeah, the, the list goes on. Then things like maintenance. So <clears throat> every single time there's a transaction, it needs to be reconciled within your accounting software and we we do a lot of that internally because we have a virtual assistant that is really really good that that pete uh, my other business partner that he he found and has trained up and it's made a, a huge difference other people outsource that to their accountants mm-hmm. and that's that's also absolutely fine it may be a bit more expensive and it may be done a bit less frequently it depends what you agree with your accountant uh yeah both absolutely fine, but but they absolutely need to be kept on top of because if you leave it kind of three four months without being reconciled, you, you don't know where you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. so coming back to the early days of opportunities, then I'm trying to get, I'm trying to imagine in my mind's eye the coming together of the four of you and how the first property kind of got purchased and what the deal was and your individual roles in it I, you know I, 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 I'm trying to be in the room so what how can you remember the first one? Oh yeah I, I very clearly remember the first one um yeah it was a it was right place right time kind of thing that we that we came across that it was a purchase option which is basically a, a contract that says you have the legal rights to purchase this property at this price. Um, before this date and <clears throat> it was a fair bit well quite quite a lot below the actual market value of it so we could in theory buy it and then sell it at market value but there was a very clear deadline and what we didn't want to do is is uh buy it pay stamp juicy 
and then sell it. We wanted to, before the contract expired, before we had to action the contract, find a buyer to sell it on at, at market price so that we didn't have to pay the stamp duty and so that we didn't have to raise the funds to buy the property. So I remember very clearly, a uh, and going back to the analysis paralysis part, um, because I'd never done a deal like this before, I, I, and there, there's no way to be a hundred percent certain that it will, it will go as expected. It got to a point where I literally analyzed the absolute hell out of it, and <laughs> and still there was something saying, "Oh, I don't know if this is the right thing to do." And I remember I was, I was in WeWork in um, uh, one of the WeWorks, I can't remember which one. And I remember my, can I swear on this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> remember the fuck it moment where <laughs> I'm like, "Oh, fuck it, let's just do it." Um, and so we yeah we committed to it and uh yeah we it, it was a bit uh hair raising because it, it took a while to we, we got very close to the the expiry date of it um but yeah we, we managed to, to sell it on um to someone who was then also able to make a profit out of it so they, right. they bought it uh they yeah, refinanced it since um a bit yeah, with uh with the benefit of a, a higher value but yeah, it was a it was right place, right right time. Um, I, I can't remember the numbers now; it was a while ago. But um, we, we made a, a good amount of profit from that. So that was so you sold the option. You, you never actually owned the property with that. You, you sold the you sold the option. We sold the option, and we had to go through uh, two solicitors because the first solicitor we used hadn't didn't know what an option was, right. and they they just saw it as mortgage fraud. I think it was, yeah, <laughs> and so well, we, you've we been asked, in from a commercial property you, you you must have experienced options in that time i know i i hadn't i i was really um, right I, again still from a property perspective working in the industry i, I was still uh fairly uh inexperienced mm. um, especially for deals like this it was very kind of vanilla projects that i was working on before yeah properties that i was working on before but so we, we we used a different solicitor who, who knew exactly what they were and how to to work with them and and we got it done. But we were we were learning a lot along the way, which was um, yeah, it was great. And that that's a, a key theme throughout everything is we were learning a lot. Um, we've I was looking at the the investment triangle the other day, which is is basically all the different ways or the, all the main ways you can invest in property, and we've we've done all but one of them. Which is new build. Right. Um, we've we've slowly worked our way through and uh, got really good experience a, across all of them. Um, but the the flip side of that is, if you just pick one and stick with it and and run with it forever, then then you get further because you're you're properly honing down what you're what you're focusing on. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so that that first deal was uh, was definitely great experience. It wasn't something that we'd. It wasn't our main strategy. What we were looking for at the time was was multi-lets and buy to, uh sorry multi-lets and hmos so um yeah buying a property and then renting them out by the room and our next deal which is kind of our first deal because it was uh our actual strategy we found a it was a three bed well we were sourced actually a three bed terraced house up in uh up in castleford that's uh yorkshire way it is yeah Yorkshire. Um, we the, God's the intent... own country. <laughs> beautiful, it genuinely, is beautiful up there. Um, it's lovely. We on that one, we had a, a few learnings as well. Um, our intention was to convert it to a it was to a four bed by using the lounge downstairs, turning out into bedroom. Uh, knocking through the small bedroom and the medium-sized bedroom upstairs to make one, and then going into the loft. So one bedroom on the ground floor, two on the first floor, one on the top floor. Uh, it <clears throat> turned out that whilst the loft had been partially converted, it hadn't been done with building reg sign-off, so we couldn't use it. Um, if we did want to get building reg sign-off, we'd need to either move the roof up, <laughs> mm. not easy, or move the floor down, which the cost of doing that was just it was too much so we ended up uh, compromising and and losing uh losing the lounge on the ground floor 
So we had two bedrooms on the ground floor and a kitchen, and then two bedrooms on the floor above. So still still four beds, but just no lounge, which uh, we operated as as a multi-let, as an HMO for some time, but because it didn't have a lounge, it wasn't that attractive. So it was it was quite difficult to let out. Um, it's, it's always been profitable. It just hasn't been anywhere near as profitable as we, we thought it would be. Mm. But uh, again, very, very good lesson in doing that because the builder we used was they came recommended. We saw some of the work that was being being done by them, being the key word, not completed, but being done by them. <laughs> right. And it looked to our eyes, it looked like it was being done well. So we went ahead with uh, Paul. I can say his name because yeah he can he can get what he gets yep. from um he basically he he started doing the work and then he ended up employing i think some 15 16 year olds to do plastering never plastered in their lives didn't wow. bother taking the light switches off the wall to plaster behind them they just plastered it around the light switches and the light fittings so they were kind of inset and uh wasn't anywhere near smooth and they did a few other things, just stupid things, and we ended up having to to get a different builder in and, and paying ten grand more than we oh. we planned to, to to spend on it. So very good learning there is to to do good due diligence on mm. builders, and and we've since I mean we've one of our joint venture partners is he has a building company and we absolutely trust him implicitly. Is um, does a, a fantastic job, but of those that we haven't done joint ventures with we we do our research we see completed projects by them we speak to people who've uh who they've worked for and yeah <laughs> that's a hard lesson to learn that i mean that <clears throat> I, I always wonder how people that invest away from where they live get on um obviously with us we i'm on site almost every day you know every other day looking in and seeing what's happening happening but if you're not there, how can you, you, you it's literally trust, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it was also a lot of, a lot of journeys, um, up the M1, um, sometimes a day trip from, from, I was at that point I was in Southeast London, uh, all the way up to, to Castleford and that I had a bit more energy back then, didn't have any kids. So I was getting a bit more sleep, um, mm. and consuming a lot of Red Bull and, and, uh, coffee. But yeah, up there maybe one once a week, which was yeah, it's quite difficult, especially in the summer when you're driving a a sub one litre car uh, with no air conditioning up the M1, uh, you're sweating away. Very yeah, a bit difficult. Yeah, um, no, that's rough, man. That is rough. But also so... sleep. Uh, we were sleep. Well, I was uh, quite regularly sleeping on site, which. I'm glad to say I don't do it anymore, but I was literally, we we ordered some furniture, being told that, that, that it would be finished by that point, so it was a good time to order the furniture. Turns out it wasn't finished, so they were it was delivered to a very dusty site. So we left all the policy on the mattresses, and I was sleeping on, like, wiping them down, and then sleeping on those, breathing in all the dust overnight with no heating, and that was uh, certainly an experience. Yeah. Um, did some of the work myself as well, mainly the the simple stuff painting the walls and I've laid a few floors as well uh yeah very glad to not have to do that now We've, yeah um, as got a joint venture partner that's um yeah that is local and is has a building company and because because he's a joint venture partner him well him and his wife um because they're joint venture partners they've they've got skin in the game they, they'll they'll do a good job because mm. if they do a good job then they see a benefit from it too mm. Yeah, that's. I mean, a lot of people would would see you in in your position now and think that you'd never done a day's work. <laughs> you know, not no. I don't mean it in like my that. soft hands. Soft yeah, hands. <laughs> but no. But people forget that you you know that everybody that's in a in a position now has been on a on a journey. You know, you don't start where you are. You, currently, you you've obviously had to learn a lot and make mistakes so that you could actually improve and refine and and slowly go up that kind of property investment pyramid that you've mentioned 
Yeah. And I mean, all, all four of us business partners, we, we tend to be pretty risk averse. Uh, and so we put in quite a lot of contingencies, whether it's financial or time. And that's not just on the projects so with with the investors we work with as well. We we always assume it will take longer, so we'll, we'll borrow the money for for longer, or we'll mm. have terms of investors lined up. Um, yeah, it's it's been it helps us sleep at night being risk averse. It also means we we say no to quite a few deals because they they may very well be profitable and and make a decent profit, but there's just there's too much uncertainty or not enough security. Uh, in committing to it so um yeah we, we've i mean a project we finished uh, a while ago which uh it was a it was about eight hundred thousand pounds refurb um a big old job that like yeah <laughs> it was um we it was not only was it a, a big job it was a listed building as well so and a conversion learning there maybe say again some learning there yeah, <laughs> learning's everywhere. Yeah, uh, we yeah we we put uh, so normally we look at kind of ten around about ten percent contingency on on build costs. We we had twenty percent on that right. just in case because with listed buildings, you you often don't know what you're going to find. But when you start knocking down walls and uh, yeah, so we're glad we did because we we spent all of it. Um, wow. So yeah, um, contingency is highly highly important. Yeah, um, I think the uh, the the whole the the whole kind of progressing up the property pyramid is fascinating to me. So that first one that you started with, that was a small HMO, presumably four bed multi let. Yeah, yeah. So how did you go about? Did you did you get good at one thing like four bed HMOs, or did you? No. <laughs> oh. So uh, well, the well. We did that. The next project was a a six bed HMO. Right. It was it was a, it was a slightly um, unusually shaped end of terrace house that hadn't been lived in for for quite a few years. Very dilapidated. But, we but up... when you start getting into six bed, you start getting into licensing. Yeah. Whereas Which four bed, brings... you don't. So all of a it... sudden, you, immediately another layer of complexity onto what you're doing. Yep. <laughs> we, yeah, we, we, when we were, I think I, I found, or one of us found the, um, the deal online. It had just come onto the market. And so immediately booked a viewing. Um, my, my business partner, Keely, turned up to the, the viewing and someone she knew was also at the viewing. And, yeah. um, uh, and we both were doing similar things. We both wanted to, to buy it. So we ended up doing it as a joint venture with them. All right. Um, okay. And so we, we still, we both put offers in. Um, one was a low ball offer. The other one was a slightly less low ball offer. And the, I can't remember the reason why, but the, the low ball offer was the one that was accepted. I think it was because that was cash. And the, the non low ball offer was, um, was a mortgage purchase. So yeah, we ended up securing that, doing our, I think, yeah, our first joint venture with them. And this is the husband and wife, uh, with where the husband has a building company right uh yeah converted that made it into a, a six bed hmo all on suites and we still have that it's still uh, a great great property it's um it's lasted lasted uh since then with with not much work done to it and yeah so we went from that we've we've individually got buy to lets uh we uh What's the next one? So I'm now looking at the, the investment triangle. Um, <laughs> residential on the bottom. So buying a house and living it. Check. Uh, buy to let. I bought uh, a few buy to lets in Scotland through a sourcing agency, which my, my business partner, Keeley, um, used to run. Uh, flips. We, we did, uh, to start with, we did a, a flip, which was a conversion of a, was it? It was a two bed making into a three bed, so splitting one of the rooms, uh, painting it all, making it look fancy, putting a new kitchen bathroom in, and then then selling that. Uh, social housing is something that we've done more recently. So we set up a a new business called Aurora Autos, which translates as Dawn Rising. 
All right. New day, new Chat dawn. GPT again, was it? No, that, that was pre chat GPT, actually. That was uh, <laughs> me looking up Latin words. <laughs> but so that was set up to to focus on uh, social housing and, and providing housing for, for vulnerable people. And um, we're, we're still, yeah, we, we still have that. Um, that was a, a joint venture with some existing investor of ours, investors of ours. So they put in, to start with, they put in 250K for us to start going out and buying properties. And uh, we have we have bought a couple of HMOs in that SPV as well. But yeah, the, the focus is social housing. Um, and then as you got the, the triangle multi-let, which is what we discussed the first one we did, HMOs, then service accommodation, which we've done. Uh, that was a property in Covent Garden in central London. We were renting that and then operating it as service accommodation. And we started off by putting it on Airbnb. It had a bit of furniture in it already. We bought the the other bits and bobs that needs to go in there, like uh, coffees and teas and mugs and plates and uh, bed linen. We found a, a cleaner that was really flexible and could could come in, do the check-ins, do the cleaning, and uh, yeah, at a fairly short notice. So we operated that on just Airbnb to start with. And then both me and Pete, we went on a service accommodation training course and learned about uh, tools like, I think we used Takeet at the time. Mm. So something that manages multiple online travel agents like Airbnb, Booking.com, Expedia. And that that changed things drastically. Uh, as soon as it went, went on to Booking.com, the, the, the occupancy went up and up. And we then did a, a nice refurb. So repainted it, got all new furniture that, that matched and looked modern and took some nice photographs, uh, did a very good SEO friendly description so that it was more searchable we systemized certain things and i think the i don't remember the numbers it's something like we're getting a, on average 150 pounds per night we then got that up to a peak of about 260 pounds per night wow and that was mostly down to i would say better photographs because of the refurb and also booking.com Booking.com tends to get, especially in central London, tends to get more bookings through that than Airbnb. Mm, it's so, funny yeah, that's... how uh, booking and Airbnb have different territories almost. It's very strange. Yeah, and you can use websites like Travago that that look at properties and find the best price for the same property across. I shouldn't be saying this, um, <laughs> but it shows the best price for the same it's property. It's always here. best to book direct miles. Yes, which is absolutely true because obviously you don't have to pay the the huge fee that Airbnb and Booking.com and, and the like take. Yeah. So yeah. We, we've, we've still got, uh, so we don't operate that one anymore, but we've got some other service combination units in, in the grade two listed conversion we did. Right. We're operating in those, uh, but we're not operating them ourselves. We've, we've got an operator. So the Yorkshire hosts uh, operating it uh, on our behalf. And they're obviously they've got their own website that, that people can book through, which, is better for us because as i said we don't pay the fees so yeah it's um yeah and, and that that kind of moves on to, to small conversions and then large conversions and i i don't know what the technical difference between a small and large when a small becomes a large but i mean the the one i mentioned that was a, a ten thousand square foot building that we converted into 14 one and two bed apartments so I, I don't know if to me <laughs> But then you said someone like Danny Inman, and that that's small to him. So <laughs> it's, yeah. all, it's all, all perspective. But yeah, it's it's been we we've done all of that, and as I said, the the last thing yet to be done, but is in process, is is new build. So I'm I'm now I'm looking for for land for development land in uh, Hampshire, right. which is where my uh, my family my family in law is, and uh, so. I'm hoping, so my father-in-law is, uh, is, is a project manager. I'm hoping I can tap him up for, for contacts when, when I do find a bit of land. But that's, that's, it's actually very difficult to find a bit of land. I've been using 
a tool called Searchland, which is which is incre absolutely incredible. There are there are other versions out there, um, Land Insight, Nimbus, yeah. and a few others. But it it's it allows you to search across every single bit of land and property uh, across England. And I haven't I haven't used it for Wales and Scotland. I assume it does go into those as well. I'm not sure about Ireland. Anyway, you can put in all sorts of criteria. So maximum size, minimum size percentage of the land that's developed so if it's zero percent then it's literally a bit of land if it's 99 percent, then it's a property that goes right up to the borders of the title you can look at use classes you can put in that it must be outside of a uh shouldn't be in green belt for example uh outside of a flood zone you can get really really granular with with your search criteria and you can use that to, to identify plots of land to buy. The only challenge is, and they, they've just released a new function which puts in the settlement boundaries, which mm. is one of the most challenging things when, you, when you're looking for land, is finding a bit of land that's within the settlement boundary. Because if it's outside, it's going to be a very difficult job getting planning on that bit of land to, to build. Yeah. There are exceptions, but if you're kind of trying to look at hundreds of plots of land and, and narrow it down that's that's one way to to do that now the tool i use i think you have to pay a few thousand extra to, to get that functionality which i haven't done yet um but i, I mean I've, I've recently gone through about 600 plots that it, it threw up and narrowed that down to i think it's about about 40 which i then sent letters out fairly recently and i'm, I'm still getting responses now right but it's uh yeah, it, it is very difficult because if you if you it's it's a much longer term strategy. And if you're looking to make money from property quickly or within kind of six months, not for you. Mm. It's it could be sometimes multi year strategy for one plot of land. So I was talking about the settlement boundary before. If if there's a bit of land that's on the very edge of a settlement boundary, as in on, on the outside but touching the existing settlement boundary. The only chance for that to be included within the settlement boundary or the most common way is the next time that local council comes to review the, the boundary. And for example, Flash. Test Valley. Uh, Test Valley Council, they're, they're not reviewing those until I think 2028 or 2029. So I found a, the perfect bit of land, which it literally, it would straighten off the edge of a settlement boundary. But I've spoken to a couple of planners and they're, they're both move on don't don't do that it's going to take too long if you want to do something soon you don't don't look at that wow. so what people tend to do is they, they get options on the land with with the owners and they just wait they wait down mm -hmm. which is what all these big companies do they just they hoard land if they've got big big pots of money they can they can hoard land and as and when the settlement boundaries are reviewed and, and the local plan is reviewed they will they will put their sites in and say can you consider these? Yeah, that's um, so. A couple of things with that. Does um, I've not looked, but does search land overlay the um, the schla so that you can, because you know, when when local councils um, come up with their strategic housing land allocations and things, they they mm. earmark certain pieces of land within a town or a, a settlement. Um, yeah, does it overlay it so you can? But I mean, everybody would do it so quickly and simply that way wouldn't it well yeah but you you got to pay for it though <laughs> yeah yeah they have different different levels of of uh the, the the cost of of getting the different levels of complexity with the searches it goes up um and the most expensive one absolutely justifiable if you're a huge house developer but then not so much if you're if you're not yeah which is so, where kind of so i've done some training um for for developments and they, they talk about going up through google google maps or google earth and looking for a bit like looking at someone's teeth and seeing that there's a tooth missing so if you look at a row of houses and there's a house missing you know that that might be a plot that you can put a house on you know so yeah. looking for the gaps in in you know streets or street architecture or streetscape or whatever it's called and then yeah. approaching those people directly the the and I, I 
those are some of the responses I've got have been for plots of land like that. Uh, right. And then when I look into it a bit more detail, it's the, the bit of land is allocated as open space for, for a previous developer who's built I don't know, 50 houses around there. And it's, it's not as easy to, in some cases, it's not as easy to identify those. In other ones, you can quite clearly see from Google Satellite that that is clearly a development that's been done in the past kind of 10, 15 years. Mm. And that it's likely that is a bit of designated open space. It's, um, yeah. yeah, but if not it easy. was easy, everybody would do it, wouldn't they? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you've done a lot of coaching as well then over the past, God knows how long, unfortunately for you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> pulling hair out and things like that. But have you? Uh, are there any themes that you've noticed of, amongst people that you've coached? Is um, themes uh, that people struggle with commonly. I would say that a lot of people look for coaching for for one of two reasons. The first is for the knowledge or the the safety that if they have the question they can ask someone who's who's done it before. Mm. And the other one is for uh, to have someone to be accountable to or someone to kind of kicking them up the arse. And of the people I've coached, there are, there are some people that they know what they're doing. Um, they just need to do it. <laughs> are you looking at someone in particular? <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, but it, it's, yeah. It, and uh, all four of us uh, business partners, we we get coached by Danny. And sometimes there's there's not much at all to, to talk about because we know what we're doing. We know the answers. Whereas a few years ago, absolutely would have been a half an hour long conversation but we know we know what we're doing we just need to to do it sometimes yeah and it's the i mean we've we've been coached by danny for danny inman uh for three years now three four years probably longer than that four or five years maybe that's almost like a badge of honor in itself he doesn't coach just anybody does he uh he doesn't know um especially now that he's he's set up uh prosperity network He's um yeah he's definitely got his and and because he's got a rather a large pipeline yeah. um which is not a euphemism. Um, <laughs> no, if it was, it would be a large pipe. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he's yeah he's he's very busy um and yeah he's he's now working with with people like uh, me and my business partners who also do coaching as well and and all the other incredible coaches that that work for Prosperity Network. So yeah, it's yeah. As I say, sometimes we have stuff to talk about. Sometimes it's a very casual conversation, and we we listen to to Danny talking about macroeconomics and and what's going on in the news versus what's actually happening and things like that. So yeah, it, it it's ebbs and flows with with property. I think yeah. Yeah, it's a funny old industry, isn't it? Because it's sometimes it's very 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 slow, and I think. That, that that speed or the the slowness of it, it allows you too much time to think sometimes um and for someone like me that doesn't think very much that can be a real killer um because i i'm, I'm more of a gut type of person um yeah. but then all of a sudden so you know something will happen and you you just get flooded with activity that you've got to sort out and it's a very interesting sector to be involved in and things that you don't realize that impact, you know, like the the interest rates that impact all sorts of things, you know, commercial mortgages, deals suddenly not stacking, buy to lets don't stack anymore, and the whole noise that comes with it. And everybody's got an opinion on property, whether they know what they're talking about or not. The whole thing, it's just a fascinating sector. For sure. And uh, one thing that that Danny talks a lot about is as i said before what what happens in the news versus what is actually going on and when i, I remember when i started when we started the, the company there were so many people saying back then why is the worst time to invest in property and there, there's a really interesting list with the kind of main things that have been cited as the worst reason to to invest in property such as uh the the, the fact that you can't claim uh in um uh, relief on on your mortgage mortgage interest and the changes to the EPCs which have now been reversed and uh, yeah all sorts and yeah if if we'd listened to all of those then nothing would have happened but mm. um, there's there are deals to be done in in every single market it's just a matter of 
changing your strategy to, to suit the, the current uh, current economy. Yeah. And I think also keeping contingencies and um, yeah, to, to allow for the unexpected because the unexpected always happens 100% of the time on every single project, stuff has come up that we haven't expected. And I think it's, it's, it's not just about dealing with it. So it's also about kind of allowing yourself to, to deal with it by having contingencies and, uh, and assuming something will go wrong. So, so extending the build time. I, I originally in one of my calcs and my calculation spreadsheets that we use to analyze a deal, I had a section that was how long will the build take? And that then popped up in another part of the spreadsheet and added three months onto it automatically. Really? Right. That's not uh, bad. Yeah. I like that. I just, I just assumed this is what the builder told us. This is what will probably happen. Yeah. Um, Cause it makes a difference. I mean, three months, uh, three months delay, that's three months worth of interest, three months worth of possibly council tax or business rates. Mm -hmm. uh, three, months lo three months lost income from it. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, really, really important to, um, to to have those contingencies then and we've yeah as i said we've, we've had so many of those we one we did actually fairly recently uh that was i think in wigan it was something we were converting for circo we part of it we, so we're converting a house into two flats we needed to put new electricity supplies in so an individual one per per property that involved digging up the ground in front, like quite a big part of the ground in front of the, the, the house, all the way down to the main road. It took us, I think, six months, at least maybe nine months to for that from start to finish of just getting that bit done because they came out quite a few times, sent the wrong person. They then realized that whoever had dug it up previously had backfilled it with concrete right to the right to the wires there's no chance of ever getting to the wires so we then had to find an alternative route but then that involves shutting off a part of the road and that involves getting quite a long notice period and making sure the traffic management system's in place and it was just it was such a calamity mm. uh, but we ended up getting a full refund from electricity northwest because they messed it up and kept on getting it wrong and so we ended up paying zero pounds for that part of it. So it, it did it did make up for some of that uh, lost revenue and uh, interest paid. But yeah, it's just stuff that you, you can't you can't predict. Yeah. You, and... can't, you can't legislate for that or predict no. that that'll happen. No. Yeah. So have you um because developments are a, a funny, funny risky business at times. Uh, have you has there any particular big losses that stick in your mind from any developments you've done or have you managed to mitigate them? We, we've we managed to mitigate that. I'm just trying to think I mean, that we've had, we've absolutely had some challenges where um, we were questioning, is this, is this just completely a, a dead duck? Um, but it was, it wasn't a, um, it wasn't a, a big development. It was actually a loan that we made. So we, it was a bit like an arbitrage loan. So we we borrowed the money for X percent and then loaned it for more. X plus. And in this X. case, it was X plus. It was X plus, yeah, a lot. Um, <laughs> it, in this circumstance, we so we we loaned the money to a company that had two sites secured one for uh, one for twenty one houses, sorry, twenty one apartments. And one for ninety nine houses and apartments. It was a, a big scheme in a in a big uh, yeah um, a fairly big town. Was it town or city? One of the two. And we did we did our due diligence. And th there's only so much you can do because you can't predict what's going to happen. Uh, mm. So the next best thing to do is to make sure your your funds are as secure as possible. Some people just do it on a handshake. We don't. We, we on this one, we've got we got a personal guarantee from the three directors, which sometimes is worth nothing because if they're not worth anything, then they've got nothing to back it up. But we we got their credit reports, we got uh, assets and liabilities, and uh, we also got charges on their homes and their their investment properties. Wow! So 
it was to an amount that was more than what we loaned them. And it, it, so I think we loaned them about, I think it was about just over 500 grand. So not, not a, an insignificant amount. Mm. And there were just delay after delay after delay. And they ended up not responding to us or just we'd ask them very clear questions and they'd not answer any of those and just say something else and just permanent prevarication. And it got to the point where we we had to say that we, we can't keep doing this. We, that we're six months past the deadline. Um, we need to, to do something. So either find other investors to, to, to swap us out with or or sell the site or, or let us help manage the finances for this project. Mm. And we offer that on quite a few occasions. And I don't know if it's ego or just, I don't know, uh, I don't know what was causing it, but they they refused. So we ended up having to find a a lawyer solicitor to um, to help get our money back, and we didn't lose a huge amount of sleep over it because it, in in our perspective, from our perspective, it wasn't a matter of if we got it back; it was when, because we had all the security. There were a few questions over the personal guarantees and the legitimacy over signatures. But we still had the the charges, which we could see on land registry. Um, it had been done by a solicitor. All the security had been put in place for the, the charges by a solicitor. And so we we started a, a I think it was a six seven month battle to to get our money back. And we ended up having to go down the bankruptcy route, as in wow. us um, bankrupting them yeah. in order to get our money back, which. Was, it was literally a last resort because you that's the worst thing for anyone to go through. And we give them every opportunity, suggested every single other way to do it, and they just weren't. They weren't helping, wouldn't wouldn't allow it. So, um, yeah, we, we, we went down the bankruptcy route, and I think three days before the deadline of that, um, they settled. Uh, so they made a settlement, and they, they found someone else to, to come in and fund everything and pay us out. And they settled not at the full amount owed to us. So over this, it was a two-year period. We were, we had our initial, uh, I think it's about 500k investment, and then we had the interest that was accruing every single day mm. um, for those two years. It was supposed to be nine months. So we had um, all that time where we were accruing additional interest. And so if they paid back everything, that would have been great. They paid back. A bit less than what was owed to us but it was still allowed us to to get all our original money back and still make a a, a profit off the back of it mm. um and that i mean there was hours and hours and hours and hours and, and days and, and weeks and months went into that because we we had to provide all the evidence go through hundreds of emails and and pick out the the relevant legal parts that would kind of demonstrate that they did owe us money and that they did know what they were doing which is one of the arguments for the one of the false arguments with a personal guarantee, people always try to say, I didn't know what I was signing. Um, in this case, absolutely not even an argument. It was just a delay tactic. Um, yeah. But it still meant we had to prove that they knew what they were doing. And yeah, it was, it was a very, very long process, but we, we got our money back. And um, as I say, we, we had security, the right security in place from the beginning. Otherwise, we wouldn't have invested. It's, um, that's fascinating yeah. and has that tainted your view on doing that again or uh, it's difficult because it, once we we did we did make money on it um, yeah it was effort though I, wasn't I, it? I am... it, that wasn't how it was sold to you yeah but it's i don't know it, it's that it's basically what um it's what mortgage companies do yeah they just have very very um they're big organizations and lots of people to do all those things and um yeah so it it hasn't it hasn't tainted um it it wasn't it's not it's not what we were focusing on anyway it's just we had a period where we knew we didn't have a project to put those funds into so we thought well why, why not put it into this yeah and yeah again yeah. I mean, well done though i mean that's that's a that's a lesson in itself on on uh, as danny says tying up your camels you know trust everyone but tie up your camels <laughs> <laughs> that's it. brilliant it's absolutely fabulous um, i mean a lot of people would have lo lost a lot of sleep over that but like you say if you've got the charges and 
and you can see the security then um but then you're at the behest of the legal eagles to to navigate that for you and sometimes that that process in itself is challenging yeah i mean we we ended up paying about 50 grand in legal fees yeah uh, did they yeah. have to pay those costs for you though uh because they settled it was it was part of the settlement right. so understood and they're yeah. looking at really yeah uh, wow yeah it is it really is important in those situations to to work with the right legal team because we we worked with a couple uh, as in a, a two different ones and there was one in particular that had, he'd set up his own business uh, his own legal practice and he was very hungry um so he he knew exactly what to do and he was yeah very assertive when when on all those calls and um yeah very explained things very clearly as well because i think solicitors can sometimes assume that you you know everything that they know and so you understand what they're talking about but not always the case yeah yeah absolutely yeah. well as we approach the end if um if you were to speak to miles junior all those years ago that was just embarking on property university would you, what advice would you have for for little Miles? Well, I to be honest, I I think I probably would have done more work on myself. To because the a big thing was was not asking for help at the beginning. If I just not cared and and kind of understood why I didn't want to do that, then I think I would have made a lot a lot more progress. But but saying that, I everything I've done. Uh, either myself or, or with uh, with my business partners, it's been enjoyable. Um, it's been a great learning experience. And I, I think you only really learn from, sorry, that's not true. You, you learn the best lessons through pain. Mm. Maybe that says more about me, doesn't it? <laughs> <But> <laughs> if, if, if someone tells you something, you're less likely to remember it than if you experience it yourself. So I, maybe not pain, but going through that. Yeah learning process i think is, is has been really important and and so i mean it, it probably cliche but i don't think i'd change anything um in fact that yeah. absolutely is cliche yeah it definitely is but i think you're right you, you know you've got great experience from doing haven't you and there's no substitute for that so i think especially i mean that lesson that you've just shared there about about loaning loaning the money and and having to recover it you know that's priceless for, mm. for some people so and that's why being you know sharing as a coach is really useful too um now if people want to connect with you i mean you're not very active on social media but if people I'm do not... want to connect with you where can they find you uh i mean on instagram miles bullet property is probably the easiest uh easiest place to, to connect with me um, as you say I'm, I'm not very active on social media i, I um uh, my business partner pete was very good at posting everything we're doing and um uh yeah so i've been somewhat relying on on exposure through him <laughs> <laughs> well but i yeah. would strongly suggest everybody connects with miles just because uh on the off chance he does post something it'll be worth reading <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> miles bullock what an absolute treat thank you very much for it thank you